Here are your hosts, Derek G and AJ. The Triple C Comeback Tour has been grinded to a halt. Aljo defends. We had some madness here. Bilal, remember the name Muhammad, finally gets his title shot. Yan Xiaonan puts down Jessica Andraj. Bate Astaka, who would have thought it? Folks, lots of fun stuff to talk about that happened in Newark, New Jersey, UFC 288. Sometimes you have these big cards where a lot of things are going to change. Everything is going to be put on its head at the end of the night. But then you have some cards where everything didn't really change too much, but some implications were still had. So folks, what's going on? Welcome back to another episode of the Bloody Water Podcast. I'm Derek G. Joining me as always, my co-host, the Santa Fe Bomber himself, the New Mexico native brother. It was a night of fights. There was some potential controversy, but obviously, I mean, listen, the night played out as it did. How do you see it? Derek, it was uh, an interesting night. I didn't see the controversy, man. I actually enjoyed myself. I thought the the best people showed the best of what they got, and it was actually a fun night. I mean, a lot of decisions, a couple knockouts. Yeah, I enjoyed myself overall, brother. How you feeling? And did you uh, bite into the controversy? I mean, it was entertaining. You have to entertain all of this stuff. I mean, listen, you had jackets stolen, Marab jumping on the cage with the Sugar Show's jacket and all that, man. Like, it was a good time. I felt like it would have been a spectacle if we would have actually been able to be there. But nonetheless, even through the TV screen, man, I mean, you had some some unfortunate parts with the uh, Burns injury mid-fight, right? Then you had, you just had what you had, man. But we're here to talk about it. We're here to break it all down, folks. So we want to give you a friendly reminder. If you're not subscribed to the Bloody Water Podcast, AJ, they should definitely be subscribing right now, right? Folks, you should definitely be subscribing right now. And if you're looking at the bottom left of the screen, right, whatever side it's on your screen, look at the winner of that week, folks. This is a battle going back, back and forth, week in, week out. And you're only finding it one place. It's right here at the Bloody Water Podcast. That's right. So, of course, you know, we guys, we give you guys our uh, quick picks. We'll show you the quick recaps. We'll let you get all of the information in the beginning and let you run if you need to. But if you're a real fan of the show, if, if you're a real fight fan here, you're going to stick around. You're going to see why we're talking about what we're talking about. And with that being said, AJ, let's give a quick peek at the scoreboard and let's move on to these prop recaps. So 38, 35 and two. I am still an underdog, even though I won the week. But AJ, 42, 31 and two. Is not bad, my friend. So we're both trickling up. We're getting there slowly but surely. I finally had a couple good weeks I've been able to string together, but it's all about momentum, baby. Let's talk about the actual results. So real quick, I'm about to pull it down in just one second, folks, but you can see there is uh, one thing I'm not too proud of here today, AJ, and that's that on our Bloody Water podcast consensus picks, I was feeling money. I was like, we're about to go undefeated on these picks. I, I take pride, obviously, in my own picks, But if we're going to do some like joint picks together, I want to make sure we shine. I felt like we missed real bad on the Yan Xiaonan, Jessica Andrade. And it was kind of how I teed it up. I mean, you remember the conversation. I was like, can she get caught with a counter? And like, yeah. And I was like, well, duh, it's a fist fight. But then it's like, that's exactly what happened. So give me a quick thought on that. Nothing too crazy, but a quick thought. And then we'll move on. Derek, I think uh, everybody was surprised at how sharp the counter striking of Xiaonan was in the face of danger and pressure, man. Very impressive. And I'll say this, I was not surprised at that angle. What I was surprised at is that the reckless abandon approach that Andrade took in her last fight against the bigger Aaron Andrade, she took the same exact approach against somebody who I thought you needed a little more technique to beat. So it took me by storm. But folks, as you can see here, one more time, 38, 35, and two, I am an underdog, 42 and 31 for my man AJ firmly in the lead. All right, now when we're talking about the props, I finally had a bounce back on this one, folks. So if you rocked with my picks, you made yourself some money here. We're talking about decisions across the board, baby. But hey, man, how bad were you sweating that Mozart Evil Web pick? I know we didn't, we didn't have legitimate props, but we both said decision, and uh, he almost got finished a couple times. A couple times, Derek, at the very end, man, that knee bar, the, oh, the whatever it, knee lock it was, man, was insane. And there was a couple uh, very, very testing moments out of uh, Lopez, man. They do look good on the ground. I think we have a new player in the featherweight division, Diego Lopez. Okay. We said he was game, but uh, I did not imagine he'd be able to give that type of uh, battle-tested performance against Evlar, uh, Movsar, excuse me, Evlar Webb. Nonetheless, folks, one more time, subscribe if you haven't yet, because we're about to get into the nitty gritty, baby. Let's talk about it. Let's get into this main card fight. Have you seen that replay, buddy? Your head was bouncing around like a pinball machine. We're time for some main card breakdown, courtesy of your hosts, Derek G and AJ. 
AJ, the Triple C Comeback Tour, the potential uh, C4 opportunity, it has been derailed. It has been stalled. And there is now the potential that Aljamain, the Funk Master Sterling, went from gimmick, went from joke to re-retiring uh, one of the greatest combat sports at combat sports athletes alive my question to you right here man is kind of on that main topic does henry cejudo retire i mean at this point you got to really think about it right you came back to make history you got stopped on that first level of that history making endeavor why take more losses or put yourself in that position i agree with you derek i feel like this was the one where if the storybook was written correctly Henry Cejudo, he stops fighting, he keeps going, he does the coach thing, he goes and be prosperous somewhere else. But like you said, he's one of the greatest combat sport athletes and one of the best competitors around. So fighting that competitive itch is why I might see Cejudo staying around in the sport a little longer. If he does stay around, he clearly made it. I mean, he made it known. He says 125 is not an option. It has to be 135 or 145. Listen, man, I don't want to make too much of it, but I did make this the point. I said three-year layoff. There is a difference between an active fighter going through regular championship camps and then a dude who is at the top of the game, but, I mean, failed to evolve just a touch, right, into this difference between 2019 and 2023. So the question really becomes, yeah, he could probably most definitely hang around with these top five guys, but you still are putting yourself in a position to continuously or continuously tarnish that outstanding resume that you have. Is it worth it? I guess that's my main question. Is it worth it to tarnish the... I think so, Derek. To tarnish the legacy that is Triple C, not many people give him the the story career, the the highlight reels. You know, there's not a lot of people clamoring for a Triple C fight. A, a lot of people do like the cringe. A lot of people hate the cringe. So it is going to put butts in seats. But as far as legacy, I don't really think he has much more to really risk you know what i'm saying like nobody's mm -hmm. taking away the gold medals nobody's taking away the belts everybody will forget for a while who you were after some point but i think if triple c stays fighting he at least has a little bit to contend with i want to go back to what you're saying about staying with the top fives mm -hmm. i think he could he could meander in that area he can definitely wade those waters but as far as taking down the elites the top of the divisions in the 45s and the 35s I don't really see it, man. And, and from this fight in particular, I was expecting to go in and just maul, absolutely maul Aljamain Sterling. And it was a great fight. It was a very close fight. And going up to weights, I don't see it working out anywhere better than it did. Probably even worse. Do you think he can actually survive in those deep waters with those 35, 45ers? It really is tough because he was having a hard time dealing with the frame and the size of Aljamain Sterling. And Sterling is a big bantamweight, but he's not a big featherweight. And you get, you get against some of those featherweights, and then it's like, this is a different ball game here. So I do think that part of the reason Henry Cejudo didn't look the same way that he did against Dom Cruz was because of how weird and lanky and long Aljamain Sterling was, man. But then you saw over time he adjusted over the course of the fight, and he was able uh -huh. to make some reads. Here's the, here's the big point. The, I mean, ultimately, the answer is no. I don't think that he can really hang with these bigger guys. But let's talk about the other end of the spectrum, Aljamain Sterling. When they asked Henry Cejudo, hey, he beat you. Where does he stand in the bantamweight division in terms of legacy? Is he number one? And Henry Cejudo basically said, well, he beat the Triple C. You got to put him at number one. We were kind of mocking a little bit in the last show saying, greatest bantamweight alive. I don't know about that. Um, and even in terms of history, it's just, it's tough to put Aljo there right now. What else does he have to do for you and for me to really solidify him as that bantamweight great? Ooh, if Aljo can go on a three to five run spree where he's just defending 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 and actually finishing these fighters then that would kind of get me to start really talking about aljo if, if if aljo is able to develop his game from a more so grappling oriented where he needs to get things to the ground but he can add, develop into somebody who's comfortable on the feet willing to fight you at your own game but still knows he's smart enough to stick to the game plan mm -hmm. then we can start talking about go and at least in my thing man and i don't know about you derek I, I uh, fights between teammates are never fun, but you gotta get the Rob fight, man. Like there's, there's always going to be that lingering thing of like, oh well, you never wanted to fight your boy because he'd smash you. Like I don't know, what do you think? Does he does he need to fight Marab? And then what else is another criteria to put to make him the goat in conversation? I think if you want to win over the casuals, right, and you want to win over just kind of like the the normal person who tunes in and says, oh yeah, that Aljamain Sterling guy, he's pretty good, right? Like if you want to win over those people. 
Yeah, you have to probably, I would say you have to beat uh, O'Malley, you have to beat Marab, and then you have to move up to featherweight. And if you can secure a belt there, then you retire into grace right there. Because if he said he needs to go on a three to five fight run or whatever the case may be, well, this is his third title defense, right? The first one against Jan, split decision. Then he finishes TJ, hurt shoulder, and then he gets another split decision. I see what you're saying. There's just, it's not, it doesn't feel devastating. It does, you know what I mean? It doesn't feel like, oh, this guy is just manhandling everybody. But a title defense is a title defense nonetheless, man. Let's real quick, uh, real quick excuse me, talk about some of these X's and O's um, on how the fight ultimately went down. Bro, Aljamain Sterling took down Henry Cejudo four times. Four times. So Henry Hudo was like, oh, I've never been taken down. He did have a 96% takedown defense going into this. But the point is... Outstruck him, took him down, used his length to his advantage, and was able to shut down a lot of the danger that comes with a Henry Cejudo, man. I mean, did you ever really see yourself in a position, because I want to talk the controversy just here in one second, but did you see yourself in a position where you're like, Henry Cejudo can actually get this thing done at any point in the fight? No, I never felt that Henry Cejudo was in the driver's seat to actually do a lot of damage to put things down. And also to that same point, Derek, as much as Aljo was getting the takedowns and was having the control, I also didn't really see many points in which Henry Cejudo was like, oh, he's in trouble now. Aljo can finish this fight too. Yeah. So it, it goes back to my point of we need to see a little bit more devastation out of the Aljo camp. But to the, the controversy that that is or that was – there was nothing, not even a glimmer of that coming from the Cejudo camp. So that's what I think, man. I, I, that's where I say the right guy won this fight. And if you take a look at the MMA decisions, you like I said, a lot of people, they're kind of uh, like crying robbery. They're saying it's Henry Cejudo should have won. Look at the verdict. And, you know, I'm a big fan of verdict. I'm a big fan of global scoring and all of that good stuff. But when you look at the media scores, the thing that I want you to pay attention to is what's the most common ruling. It's 48-47. This was a close fight. This was by no mm -hmm. means a landslide in either direction. But you got two people that are down here with the Cejudo dub. Uh, most people have it in favor of Sterling. I'm a little surprised at this one, 49-46. Um, for Sterling because Henry Cejudo did manage to make some of these rounds really really close but at the end of the day and still Triple C fails to become C4 um, I'm gonna take a uh, a bold bet and I'm gonna say we don't see Triple C again in the octagon I think it's wise to hang it up and I do think that we will now legitimately have that conversation of like who was the better guy was it Cejudo or was it uh, DJ Mighty Mouse? I think it's I think it's Mighty Mouse, man. You know he's yeah, over. He just yeah. defended his belt again with the trilogy and Rice. But all right, man. Talk about this co-main event. A co-main event that somewhat was marred um, by an injury. Gilbert Burns. We don't know. Like we don't know, right? If this was pre-existing or if it really did happen in the cage. It kind of seems like it happened on a takedown attempt. But then again, him and Henry Hooft in the corner were so covert about it and failing <laughs> to actually hit it on the head that it makes it feel like he came in with a pre-existing injury but wait aj Bilal also said oh yeah my ankle yeah yeah it was, it was pretty jacked up coming into this fight uh but nothing was going to stop me from this opportunity so what are the odds man we get two dudes everyone is never 100 percent healthy going in but we get two dudes who are like legitimately kind of hurt coming in fighting for a title does this not go back to what we said in the beginning? These are the two hardest working guys in the division, two blue collar guys. What do you make of that whole entire debacle? Man, uh, it's rough because as much as, yeah, we all saw the picture of Bilal's ankle and that was, it came out before and I thought, I was, was this an AI? Is this an edit? Is this something <laughs> else going on? And then Gilbert comes in with the shoulder and we see, he, I, I agree with you. And he told his coach about, he's like, oh, my left shoulder. The coach literally said, can you fight around it? Like we've been, we've, it, to me, it sounded like a, we've been through this before. Are you good to go the way we have been going previously? Or we talked about this is the point we talked about. So it's rough, man, because you're right. You're never going to have anybody that's 100% in, especially these guys took it in a, a short notice fight. So there's no way you're taking the short notice fight and then pulling out and making yeah. Dana man, doing all that stuff. So it seems like it was a, a necessity for them boys to step in the ring. I don't know, though, Derek. I don't, I don't feel... I don't feel bad nor jaded on any of the thing. It, it does suck. It does yeah. suck, but it's kind of the, you stepped on, you signed the dotted line, stepped in the cage. It's how you got to fight that night. It is what it is to me. And it's nice because it's both people down a weapon. You can't, I, some would argue that a shoulder versus a ankle is nowhere near the same, but they're both uh, very devastating injuries to a fight game. Yeah, man, and that was the other tough thing, too, is that if you look at Bilal Muhammad, he did a lot of stance switching. He generally switches stances a lot, right? But Henry Hooft was trying to call it out, like, hey, that leg is hurt. Target that leg. 
And then Bilal, when he finally picked up, oh, that shoulder's hurt, started throwing <laughs> leg kicks or head kicks, excuse me, right? Beating up the shoulder. Both shoulders were hurt on Gilbert. Is this a fight that you would entertain wanting to see a rematch in? Or let's just say hypothetical land, Bilal completes the conquest, gets the gold. Does Gilbert deserve, uh, Gilbert Burns deserve a title shot against Bilal in that type of rematch? The same way that we kind of want to see like a Leon Edwards, Bilal, Muhammad rematch. What do you think? 100% Derek and I think it'd be criminal to not give Jorinho an actual legitimate rematch I'd love to see these two fighting for the actual belt too because that is a grind of a fight these guys are gonna be putting everything into it man and I mean I, I think that's that would be some cosmic justice right there going forward I do I do think that one thing that's a little bit different about Bilal versus a lot of these other fighters is that for him I think every fight is a title fight because every every fight is his opportunity to move one step closer to a championship fight which has been eluding him for so long. So the dog is in both of these guys but is it just me, AJ? I said, we keep discounting this guy. We keep betting against him. And that's why I said, I have to roll with Bilal. I love me some Gilbert. There was just one other big noticeable difference, man. Gilbert used to fight at 155. Bilal Muhammad will never make 155. Bilal Muhammad mm -hmm. was notably a larger man and was able to take some of Gilbert's best right hands kind of with no problem. So that's the other problem right there. People forget Gilbert is not the biggest 170 pounder in the world, you know? Yeah, he definitely looks like he's the bigger fighter. Media day, he's pressing up, but then you see him stand together in the cage too. It looked like Bilal bloomed up a lot more than Gilbert. And you're right, I expected Gilbert to be the, the bully in there. And sure enough, man, Bully B showed up and showed why he deserves that name. Remember the name, Bully B, Bilal Muhammad, man. Finally, um, it's either going to be Colby or it's going to be Leon. But either way, he gets his opportunity, and that's the only thing he's asked for. So this was a huge victory, marred in injury. But uh, nonetheless, man, five rounds. I mean, pretty much domination by Bilal Muhammad. All right, bro. Short and sweet right here. Nine. Yan Shao Nan looked crisp. She was tall. She was long. She was sharp. She was fast. And Jessica Andraj. I think what we're starting to see now at this point, especially with the comings and goings of up and down weight classes, she has one, one kryptonite, man. The, I said it. Yan Shao Nan is of the mold of a Rose Nama Yunus, which Je Jessica Andrade kind of struggles with. The fast fighters who have good footwork, good head movement, and are very evasive and elusive and will uh, strike on the back foot. Let you come in with these big winging hook combos and take advantage of it. And that's exactly what happened. Here's my question to you, AJ. I was surprised that Jessica Andrade is continuously taking this swinging at the fences approach, right? We know that's her bread and butter is the big blitzes, but this is like almost a reversion a little bit to where we can't contain five, six punch combos. And instead we're just saying, I don't care. I'll eat as many as possible. I believe in my chin, maybe a little bit too much. Finally paid for it tonight. What'd you make of it? I think you hit the nail on the head, Derek, 100%. Because when you see a fighter lunging in and just winging, curling hooks at people and the opponent's not even in front of you, there are they've already stepped off. They've already seen what's happening. They've taken their angle to hit you and you're still trying to just wing something left and right. It's a, it's a bad look and I think regression is one of the best words. Sometimes when you depend on your power a little too much, that's what we saw going into this fight. And a very, very crisp and precise uh, Yan Jianan put exactly what you want to see in a counter striker to work, man. And I mean, it's it's kind of that same point, right, that I made. At certain points, you're betting on these fighters, strictly from a wagering perspective. You're saying if they come in and they use their skill set to uh, implement this game plan, easy money. And the one part about Jessica Andrade that we've gone away from that I just don't understand is almost she refuses to use her jujitsu, almost like she doesn't have it, like she's just a pure kickboxer. So I said it, you know, and I and I don't mean to keep going. I said it, I said it, but I'm just like, and in my head, it played out perfectly. I said, Yan Shao Nan, this fight stays on the feet. This is her easiest path to victory. Mix it up, become a true mixed martial art. Don't become, but like implement a true mixed martial artist game plan. Take her down, take away her best weapons. But instead, Yan Xiaonan finally gets herself to the point right there where she probably rightfully belonged. And she gets right back into that top five title contention because after she lost that split to Marina Rodriguez, who also lost here this weekend, it's almost like you're in no man's land. So Yan Xiaonan, man, she's tall, she's sharp, she's crisp. Can she compete with a uh, Wei Li? Ooh, tall, sharp, crisp, Derek. The one thing she is lacking is the power. And I think the, the poise and control that uh, Wei Lee presents 
might be a little bit of a challenge, man. I, I still, I like Wei Li in that fight, but I'd love to see it because I feel like Yan Zhao Nan doesn't have a lot of hype or excitement behind her, which could be the most dangerous opponent when the other one thinks you're, you know, they, they think a little less of you and you walk in and then you starch them. Could happen. Well, I mean, is it not, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to put her in this mold, but like John Jones, Sergey Pavlovich. Sergey Pavlovich is probably your biggest test to date, but nobody knows him, so you're not going to take uh -huh. the risk. What are we talking about, right? This is different, though, because this is China versus China for Wei Li and Xiao Nan. My big question, though, is I, I'm going to be honest with you, man. If I had to give an early prediction, I say Wei Li cleaned her up with wrestling. She looks like a D1 wrestler out there, man. She has the big striking, but she really just nullifies her offensive approach, which is, I think, what the smart fighter would have done here. Big win by the under-respected um, Yan Xiaonan. I think that finally people will put a little more respect on her name, especially with this big finish. But, man, seeing Andrade just get floored like that, man. She just took a clean one, just shut her down. And even when the referees uh, let her know what happened, she was like, mm, all right, all right, you got me. You got me. At this point, last thing, and then we'll move on, is Jessica Andrade now, our title hopes kind of getting thrown out the window a little bit, and are we just be, we're just a prize fighter. We're just making fun fights. I think so, Derek. We're in for the money at this point. Big left hook, Larry's all day long, but uh, hopefully big paychecks, but I agree. The, the gold seems to be slipping further and further. One thing you know is that if Jessica Andrade steps in the cage, it's going to be a fun fight. So you definitely got a place for that here in the UFC. All right, brother. Now, in one of the most unexpected fight of the nights that I've probably seen in UFC history as of late, Diego Lopez lost this fight, but somehow got his yeah. win money, got his show money, and got a 50K bonus from a fight of the night over here against Movsar Ivloev, man. Dude's jujitsu is nasty. He is Alexa Grasso, the current reigning flyweight champion. Um, he is her head grappling instructor. So the thing is, man, we knew he was dangerous. I said it coming in. He's a finisher. These are the guys that you got to watch out for because Ivloev had nothing to win. And I felt like even though Ivloev won, he still lost. So what, <laughs> what do you think? Man, how tight and how quick the submissions came out of the Lopez corner, man. That first arm bar, the knee bar, anything, the Kimura attempt that he had were so fast and so quick that he, I feel like even Mosar was uh, surprised. He was like, oh, shit, my arm's here? What the hell? And, like, he needed to do just – he pulled some veteran moves, you know, using other limbs to get the get the, the lock out, get the elbow pass, the hip, and all the stuff that – man – Seemed like it was a necessity to do in which he needed to needed to have it happen to win that fight. And you saw him wincing a couple times at the end, Derek. As far as our, uh, as much as the win was basically guaranteed, there was still a lot of moments right up to the bell where it was not. And it was still a dog fight. And that's why I like Lopez, man. I think that's why Dana White paid him a lot, too, because this guy fought to, from bell to bell, even with the odds stacked against him, man. You got to love it. I mean, homeboy lived up to his his chest tattoo, man. He said, dream, believe, and make it happen, bro. And that homeboy made it happen. I will say this. I was a little surprised at a couple of Evil Loeb's, um lack of understanding of some of these kind of basic positions. And it makes sense because he's a wrestler, right? And he even noted, he was like, I'm not too good at jujitsu, man, but my, his wrestling is phenomenal, clearly, right? But when you get to that position where you take somebody's back... You got a gable grip and you're hugging their waist, right? The number one thing that you should be doing as a jujitsu guy to try to like open up a threat or opportunity is you put a Kimura lock on that arm that's right there. And then you go to use it to try to sweep or to try to get your guard back or, you know, whatever the case. And he fell into that a couple times. And I was like, oh man, you keep going back to it. And I was like, you're not seeing it. And Diego Lopez, man, it just felt old school jujitsu, man, like beautiful thing to see right here. But when he was on the feet, I thought he should have kept it on the feet a little bit more if he could, man, because he was cracking Evil Loeb. And uh, at the end of the day, like I said in the beginning, man, a new contender has been born in the featherweight division here in the UFC. But I don't want to get too ahead of ourselves. You hung, you hung with the top 10 guy, a very skilled top 10 guy. But it also kind of went into your, how would you say, your wheelhouse in terms of your skill set. I think that was a good matchup for him. So do you think he'll fare well against the rest of the top 10? Man, the top 10, what's the what's the good and the bad thing for Lopez, man? He faced a top 10 fighter right away, so I don't think they're going to give him anything below 15 from here on out. Uh, can he survive against the top 10s? Man, I don't, I don't want to give this guy a non-shot, but it's going to be a hell of a battle because you're right. I feel like Mozart played his hand into Lopez's fight game where I don't think a lot of other fighters will do that. I'm going to say no, Derek, but I think in the top 15, he can do really, really well. 
I think, believe it or not, they give him a fight, his next fight, not in the top 15. I think it'll be someone near it, but I think they definitely, like, give the man a chance to to definitely get the training wheels off in the UFC. He didn't really have them at all to start off with Evil Oev on short and on five days' notice. But, all right, man. Um, last question, Evil Oev, this, I mean, this win doesn't do anything for him. Where do you go? You, you lost out on a pretty big opportunity, and now it's just you're in no man's land. You, I don't think he moves up. You know what I mean? What do you think? No, he doesn't move up. I, I'd honestly be kind of surprised if the odds makers don't move him down just off of that, man. Newcomer coming in five days notice. You don't finish the fight. You almost get finished in the fight. Um, you were basically in no man's land. Who, who Do you remember who he was supposed to fight before? No, but let me find this out right now because – I did have it down. Oh, Bryce Mitchell. That's right. Uh, yeah. I think they give him, give him that fight or another similar fight back to another grappler again. It seems like that's what they wanted for this one. But I don't know, Derek. What do you think? Yeah, no. I mean, maybe run back that Bryce Mitchell fight once uh, Mitchell is healthy. It'll make a little more sense, especially because it's not like Eve Love's performance was anything that was like, no, you got you need a top five guy now, you know? Yep. Either way, big, big win for Evil Web, but also a big win for Lopez, even even <laughs> without the win. Big win. All right, man. Now, yeah. this is the the oddity of the bout, or of the fight card right here. Crone Gracie versus Charles Jordan. I felt like we were all excited to see Crone back, right? Fantastic jiu-jitsu. Um, notably, yeah, he has always had this old-school game. I don't know why people are just picking up on it now, but his, his whole thing is closed guard, back takes. I mean, just like none of this new-school Barambolo-type crazy jiu-jitsu stuff. And he implemented his game plan against Charles Jordan, except this time it felt like we saw a little bit of a regressed reversion of Crone Gracie where he just didn't want to throw. He didn't want to open up. He didn't want to use his hands. Um, terrible game plan against a Charles Jordan. But Jordan, you have to admit, he did all the right things in terms of just shelling up and not leaving himself extended to get his arm caught in something. What do you think? Yeah, no, man. You said it yourself there. Perfect way to avoid all the dangers that Crone Gracie has to offer. And I loved once Jordan started to see what was going on, he started throwing up uppercuts, stuff down the middle, get away, and then and then scooting off on the corner and actually dipping out. This is uh it was interesting to see how much in three years the the game of MMA has really evolved. Cause you're right, back in you know when Crone when Crone's still fighting 2019, 2018. He was dangerous. His hands were dangerous. He looked sharp. He had multiple assets of the fight game to get going. And this one, you saw just uh, Air Jordan was levels above on the striking game. Saw everything coming possible on the feet. And then when the ground game happened, he was still able to stay calm, composed, and defensively sound and fight his fight. Very impressive for Jordan. Yeah, I'll say I was just completely blown away by Jordan's maturity in this fight. We had mentioned it before. This is why it's hard to bet on him because he's always done doing something wild that you don't, that you don't expect. And you're like, no, don't do it. Like, you need to stay stick uh, stick to the game plan. You need to strike with him. And that's exactly what he did. No flying knees this time. No crazy spinning shit. At the end of the day, man, he just stayed within himself, and I think that he was looking at the long, the long game here, the long con, and uh, the long con was get a win over the Gracie. Now you're in the history books, but uh, for Crone, man, let's talk about this side because it kind of mars Jordan's fantastic performance. What a lot of people are are arguing some crazy things. They're saying maybe he just needed money, uh, maybe he was forced into this, and maybe his people influenced him to fight, and he really doesn't want to fight. I mean, did you read into any of that stuff? Did you get that vibe or that sense from Crone? I mean, the whole fight week and everything. I man, not I mean, not really. You know, it seemed like Crone to me is just a, a, a mountain man who likes his privacy. He likes to live in Montana, go on his farm, hunt, kill, do things, train to fight. And nothing, nothing wrong with that. And I'm I'm always of the firm belief, and and you know I guess everybody's of their own. But um, nobody, as a man, as a human being, nobody can make you do anything. You know, you can always somebody has a gun to your head, you can always take the bullet. You do not have to do anything. Somebody. For, uh, is trying to make you unless they can physically do that and that's why we train to fight that's why we train to protect ourselves because nobody can physically do that so i don't know man i don't i don't buy into it maybe he needed money because that is the ultimate you will do mm -hmm. a lot of things because you need money grown gracie doesn't seem like much of a uh, possessions man or a uh you know clout kind of guy so i don't know if the money was necessarily chasing there what do you think Derek? Well, in the wise words of my, my man AJ right here, you always have a choice, and he did have a choice going into this one. I will say this, the storyline behind Crone, obviously we don't know Crone Gracie, but the storyline behind him as a personality, as a public figure, is that he his family, because he is a Gracie, he is from the direct lineage of the Gracie, he's Hicks and Gracie's kid, 
I mean, they kind of put him in these positions where he needs to compete and he needs to put on for the Gracie name. He always said, he's like, that's in my blood. It's just part of my story. It is what it is. So in everything he does, he represents the Gracie clan. Well, maybe they're like, your ass needs to get out there and need to go fight. Even Dana White, though, after the performance, he's like, I don't want to shit on him. Didn't have the best performance, but I really like him. He's a cool guy. So there's some, there's something going on. I don't know what's going on here, but I will say this was a big, big win for Charles Jordan. This is arguably one of the biggest wins name-wise in his repertoire, even though if you look at the context and you look at the reality, it's it's not really the biggest win. This Everyone was saying, they're like, it looks like Kron Gracie just got out of a time capsule from 1995 and fought the current generation. And I think this is a good point in that argument of, these new guys are so dangerous because they're good at everything. Back in the day, everyone was a specialist. Specialists don't really exist anymore. So do we see, I mean, everyone has a contract to fulfill, but do we see Kron Gracie in the octagon again? Like, do we want to see this performance time and time again? This performance, no, Derek, but I do think this performance will shed light to Kron Gracie and show him exactly that, that he's still a little bit behind, a little bit, you know, back in his own specialist era like you're talking about. Uh, he develops, he grows, he kind of starts being more of that pressure fighter, always in your face, and then able to get to where his specialty lies. That's the kind of fighter I think we can see at a Crone Gracie, and I do think we see him fight again. Definitely not up at this caliber, you know, as an Air Jordan, but maybe a little lower. Give him, give him a little tune up, see how he goes, see how he fares. I like, I like him, man. I like the idea of having at least some sort of lineage in UFC. You know, it's always providing back and forth in the past to the future. But not not if you're getting whooped on. Yeah, I mean, fair point, brother. Fair point. Big win for Charles Air Jordan. And with that being said, that was your UFC 288 main card, folks. It was a fun one. Like I said, not a lot changed, but a lot happened. And that's still important. Now, with that being said, um, I want to talk about a couple of these prelim bouts that we have on deck here, man. And the one that I want to talk about first and foremost is Matt Steamroller Frivola. He capitalizes on the opportunity that we were talking about going into this fight. I said it. Drew Dober is giving him a shot. What does Drew Dober have to gain from this fight? Probably nothing, but Matt Frivola is a bad, dangerous man. And what did he do, man? He caught him. Drew Dober, as soon as he was starting to take over the fight, Matt Frivola came out of left field, started picking up his action, and then just caught him with the counter, man. And then nasty follow-up, got the job done. Some people are crying that there was a little bit of an early stoppage, um, and Drew Dober was contesting it, but he did look like he was out on his feet when he tried to stand up. What would you make of it? Man, that was uh, the only thing that was coming from an, uh, not stopping the fight at that exact moment was more damage to Drew Dober. Homeboy was leaking on the mat. His eyes were glossed over. The only reason he was able to you know, protest a little bit was because he, had, uh, he stopped getting punched in the face. So I, I actually think it was a perfect stoppage. It, the only one where I was like, maybe this was a little bit short stoppage was the Yan Zhao Nan Jessica Andraj. But even then, she got stuck. So yeah. no, this was not a short stoppage. This was saving some brain cells for Drew Doberman because this was a, a hell of a shot from Frivola, bro. And he can crack. This was a great fight all around. I was very excited to see this one. This is action all day long, man. So this is the thing about Matt Frivola. I've been really high on this guy for a long time and it always felt like he was in that tier of fighters who was just like you're good to make these splashes but when you get really tested against these high quality opponents we just we just can't quite get there and now he's starting to get there now we're stringing three together and then what does he do man when i'm talking about capitalizing on your moment i'm talking about him saying patty let's fight he literally said it stop being a bitch let's fight and i was like bro you couldn't have done it better. Matt Provola won the night, in my opinion. Steamroller. Let's go, baby. But you know Drew Doper will be back in epic fashion when he does come back. Question is, Matt Provola, you got a number next to his name now, baby. Come Tuesday, can he compete with these guys in the top 10 to 15? Ooh, I think so, Derek. I think we don't want to push him up too fast because you're right. I do think he needs a little bit of time to build into those top five. But I think he sticks around for a little bit right here. All right, I'm going to pull it up really quickly just because I'm slightly interested. Before we hop into our official rankings review, I won't pull it up on the screen. But if you take a look at top 15, top 10 to top 15, I'm going to throw out a couple of names. And I just want you to tell me if this is somebody that uh, you think that he could be able to hang with. I'm going to give you one right now that maybe this isn't fair. But honestly, this is this is right there next to him. Uh, Hanato Moikano. Ooh, yes, I think he does. OK. Grant Dawson. Harder fight? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that one. 
Demir Ismagulov. No, I don't think he gets one on Demir. Dan Hooker. Yeah, show it depends on how Dan Hooker shows up. I won't hate on Dan. I think instantly in my mind he says uh, Frivola can get this one, but I won't hate on Hooker because he can show up on the fight night if he does. All right, last one, Jalen Turner. No, no, on, bro, I think I think on. Turner stops him from five feet away. So this is kind of what I'm saying though is now you ask for the shot and you got it, baby. So be careful what you wish for. But I'm all in favor of the steamroller camp, man. I wish him nothing but the best. That was a fantastic performance right there. And with that being said, talk about a couple other ones, man. Um, listen, this this is one that I said it got buried on the prelims, but I, I wanted to hear more about it. I wanted to see this be pushed a little bit more. Vina Janjadova dominates Marina Rodriguez. Look how quickly you go from being potentially one fight away from a title shot. To now you lost two in a row. Now Marina Rodriguez is 36 years old, kind of in no man's land. And Vina Janjadoba is slowly but surely climbing up those rankings. I mean, what did you make of this performance here? This is a classic Janjadoba performance, and it kind of felt like Rodriguez grappling regressed just a little bit in this fight. So what do you think? I don't know if it was so much a regression as Marina Rodriguez grappling, but as far as uh, Vina Janjadopa is being so talented and so many steps above on the grappling of Marina Rodriguez, because, man, it looked, it, as a striker, all I saw was just a look of being drowned on the mats from, from Marina Rodriguez, and it was very rough seeing it. She, she just, every time her butt would hit the ground, you see her just take that, that breath of, fuck, again? Like, shit. I'm back here, post down, try to do all the stuff you need to and just get and drown in those mats, man. It was a rough one. Great fight for Janja Doba, though. This is uh, a very excellent performance to showcase what Janja Doba can do and not necessarily showcase a lot of her weaknesses. Like Marina Rodriguez did not exploit anything on the feet that made a, a, a bit of concern at all. Do you think there was any concern coming from the Janja Doba court? I th yeah, I thought at certain points. I mean, you gotta you gotta remember, uh, Rodriguez. She went around. I'm pretty sure she went around just from strikes. I didn't think she should have won the round, but I believe that she was granted a round um, because when she was able to get Janjadova on the feet, she was able to take advantage as long as it lasted. But here's my problem, bro. Janjadova is a phenomenal grappler, but she didn't really set up any of her takedowns. She was shooting from way far out, and she was just able to get them time and time again. Mm -hmm. Gets in on a single. Marina Rodriguez does like 85% of the correct stuffing in terms of being able to get like get out from that single. But then the fence is right there. Now you can't complete the takedown defense. And now you get taken down. And now you're against the cage. And I will say at the very end of the fight, Marina Rodriguez did have a triangle attempt that was right. It was like almost begging, like, please take this triangle. And instead, she opted for some up kick. So maybe she could have got a triangle. Would have been tough against Jan Jadoba. But uh it just it felt to me like Marina Rodriguez really, really dropped the ball on this one. This is probably not her best performance, but it doesn't matter because Vina Janjadoba, she gets the win. She gets elevated, and now we'll see what happens. But I just want more traction in this division, man. This strawweight division needs a little more movement. It's been real slow over the course of this year, and uh, I want a new contender for Wei Li. That's not Yan Chao Nan because she's already been in the mix. You know what I mean? But big win um all right man heavyweights parker porter <laughs> bro finished braxton smith i was like yo obviously if you're a better the upside on braxton smith was almost too much to, to stay away from because he came an inch away from a fucking nuke from hell with a right hand over the top multiple times but the more experienced parker porter put him in his place so i mean what'd you make of that fight Man, you you said it yourself, Derek, an inch away, centimeters away, the gust of wind that, that Parker Porter fell. It's probably hurt a little bit as well, man, because, yeah, uh, Braxton Smith, you got to love that this dude comes out, gas on the pedal and or foot on the pedal, just, oh, bro, he was swinging for the fences. And uh, Parker Porter looking slim, looking mm. uh, a little little toned up. This dude's getting serious about his fighting career, man. I'd love to see it. This was a very entertaining fight for these big boys, man. That's right, man. And I will say Braxton Smith. Let's not forget this dude. I think he just uh, joined an MMA gym. So doesn't, he doesn't train like legitimately, you know what I mean? Like professionally. So I expect to see some big things from him in the future, but I don't think that we see his next fight in the UFC. I think unless he has some like three fight contract that he signed or something, I think they're like, no, 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 no. You need to go pick up some experience <laughs> because uh, 90 second gas tanks don't do very well in the UFC. All right, man. This is probably my most impressive performance of the night. Like the Matt Favola one was stole the show because of like how he followed it up. But Ikram Alaskarov, man, he starched Phil Hawes. And this was a fight where I was like, if Ikram can get the takedown, he wins. 
especially if you can keep Hawes down, right? But I think that I picked Hawes because I felt Hawes could get back up and he could damage him on the feet. He was putting it on him until he wasn't, man. But something weird happened, bro. It's like it's like Hawes for a second, there was a momentary lapse or something. He got caught, something we didn't see, and just kind of froze up. And then a one-two down the pipe. And, bro, when you fall in segments in like three segments you know your brain is completely shut off like he fell his body crumpled three different ways and then finally hit the mat i was like ikram just caught a body bro i mean this dude is a real real legit guy at 185 what do you think to to quote my girlfriend when she saw this knockout happen she goes what happens if somebody dies in the ring (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, they For died. Real. I don't know. <laughs> Thankfully, it hasn't happened yet. I think. But you're right. The way he crumpled was very concerning. They were they were talking about he had a head kick before. I didn't see it, man. I, I didn't see what exactly stuttered him to not put his hands up, to not eat a clean one-two down the pipe. But, man, very impressive from Ikram, man. That was uh, – I was with you, Derek. I was thinking Ikram needed, needed to get this fight to the ground. And the next thing you know, the cleanest, most technical one-two we've ever seen down the pipe puts Phil Haas to sleep and snoring. And you got to also take into consideration, man, this isn't a guy who just kind of came out of nowhere. I mean, Hamzad has been giving him high praise. If you actually take a look at his record, his whole sole loss, he's 14-1, and one, got knocked out by Chemayev, right? First round <laughs> uppercut, got knocked out. But Chemayev did say that um, Ikram was his toughest fight to date. I don't know, maybe now with the Gilbert Burns fight, but... High praise for that, man. I want to see him again, and I want to see him against someone big, bad, and dangerous because clearly he could rise to the occasion. All right, man. With that being said, I think that's enough of the prelims. There was a couple other fun fights there, but uh, you, let's uh, let's jump into it, man. Let's jump into a little bit of a rankings review, my friend. And, uh, you know, today, there's really a couple different places that we can go here today, AJ. And before we actually jump into it and I pull out the, the Google spreadsheets and the whole nine, man, I kind of want to do it joint today. And I kind of want to figure out what do you think is the most pressing division that we should talk about? There's some movement in the bantamweight division, of course, right here, right? But the only other things of note that you have to talk about are either the women's strawweight division or it's going to be the welterweight division. So which division would you like to jump in here to do, uh, today, AJ? Mm. I think the one that has the most the most heat behind it, at least at the moment, is that bantamweight division. I was looking at the rankings right now as well, man. And the uh, the welterweights, yeah, it, it, there, there's a little bit of movement going on, but I think we've talked about that a lot. I like that the uh, the bantamweights, man, with Aljo, the Sugar, Mirab. There's a lot of fights that can come, man. Especially like you're saying, the um, even Piotr Jan come back in Marlin. There's a lot going on. My big question to you, Derek. What the hell happened to Corey Sanhagen? Why is nobody talking about this kid again? Does he even have the shot? Are we just are we just strictly Aljo Sean Marab? Well, here's the thing. Corey Sandhagen has kind of made it clear himself. He's like, I'm going to do whatever I can to get back to that title opportunity, regardless of the path that it takes me on. So if it takes me on the path where I have to fight Marab, I've already stated I want to fight Marab. Well, guess what? You might just get that chance because Marab doesn't want to fight Aljo and Sugar Sean is already going to get the shot against Aljo. So that's the, that's how we line it up. We say Marab versus Sandhagen, O'Malley versus Sterling, and then whoever's the winners of those fights, they fight. And if Al, Al already made it clear, he says, if I win against Sugar Sean, I'm going to go up to 145 and I'll fight Volk or whoever is the champion right there. Either him or uh, uh, Yair Rodriguez, right? And then that's the thing. Marab... If he loses, well, you go back to the grindstone here at the top of the bantamweight division, and if he wins, it kind of sets it up perfectly, right? Aljo vacates. Maybe they do an interim title fight or just a, a just overall contender type series. I don't know, man. I think it's, a, it's actually very neat in the bantamweight division unless a wrench gets thrown in there and one of these guys, Rob Font, uh, I mean, Song, you know, one of these guys comes out with a steel chair and just cracks somebody over the head. I mean, I don't know. Do you think it's more complicated than that or – no, I actually love the way you're setting that up, man. Marab versus Corey, Sugar versus Sterling. And I, you're right. If there's ever somebody who's going to come in with a steel chair out of the left corner, it'd be <laughs> Song Gidong because this boy has missiles for hands. Yeah, I, I mean, Song Gidong gets a knockout, Piotr Jan, then knocks out Rob Font. He's almost undeniable, you know, yeah. and like, especially when the other ones are fighting. Yeah, that I like that. Is man, I wish this is times when I wish the USC would do a little bit more like tournament style. Mm-hmm. So that way we can know. Cause then when you know the path to the top, there's a little bit more uh 
pressure on the line, if you will. It's like, I need to win this fight. Or like, oh, I don't want to face that guy, so I got to play my cards right. I like that whole aspect. Well, that's the thing is the UFC isn't going to take a page out of Bellator's book, but this is the perfect opportunity for a bantamweight Grand Prix. I mean, I'm just saying, you know what I mean? But the, Bellator literally just did. Patchy Mix just won the Bellator Grand Prix in the bantamweight <laughs> division. So, listen, there's going to be a lot of opportunity for movement, but if there's a couple of players who can come out of left field, we're talking about Umar Nurmagomedov. We're talking about Song. We're talking about Rob Font. I think everybody else is solidified where they're at for the moment, and we have to see some fights just kind of shake out. But for the meantime, man, bantamweight is a bad, bad division, as we always say. All right, folks, with that being said, that is your show here today. If you have not subscribed, you should absolutely subscribe. You should follow me on Twitter for fun, some fight night updates. I think that I do a good job at handling the Twitter sphere. My man AJ is live on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Santa Fe Bomber. So definitely a different medium right there, my man. But what can the people expect when they tune into your stream? Folks, Joe, go check it out. Twitch.tv slash Santa Fe Bomber. The best word I've heard described is variety streamer, man, because we're doing a lot over there. I got a lot of life going on, art projects, playing games, but the biggest, most important thing, folks, when you jump on to Twitch.tv slash Santa Fe Bomber, hop in the chat, then we can start breaking down some fights. That's when I know y'all are actually in the mix and wanting to see what it is. And that's the best part about the platform. Hit me up in the chat. Let us know what you want to see, what you want to talk about, all that stuff. And we can engage going back and forth like that, man. That's one of the reasons why I like Twitch so much is because it gives us a chance to actually chop it up, go back and forth, just like Derek and I do week in and week out right here. That's right. And that's at the end of the day, if you want a little bit of more access into the nitty gritty of what the process is for breaking down fights, if AJ, do you think that he just slings mud at the wall and he's having these fantastic records over here? No, some study comes into this, some film breakdown and some real thought process, because at the end of the day, it can look fantastic on paper and not come out to fruition. So, folks, this is the Bloody Water Podcast. AJ. Last time I checked, this is uh, your favorite fighter's favorite fight show. So once again, tell a friend to tell a friend. You know where to catch us. Catch us on Friday. Next week, we're going to be breaking down Jarzinho Rosenstruck versus Jelton Almeida. That'll be a fun one, brother. All right, my man. That's it for us. Until next time. Peace.